So without further ado, I want to talk a little bit about Jesse Hagopian, who's going to come up and give us a reading. Jesse Hagopian is a teacher at the Garfield High School, a lovely young man. I just met him, and I just fell in love with him. And so that's OK. And he is going to, because when you get to be my age, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> you know, it's my world. And um, he leads the Black Student Union there. And who knew? you know, all these years later that there would even still be something called a black student union. So he leads that black student union. He um, also was the, the lead staff person for, um, for uh, Aaron's campaign for the Senate in 2006. So this young man <laughs> has also already had a great number of accomplishments, but also tonight he is here not to talk about necessarily his accomplishments, but to read from um, Aaron's book some portion of it for us. So without further ado, may I please um, introduce here. I want you to imagine that it's 1968 and, you know, Johnny Smith and Tom, uh, and John Carlos and Tommy Smith are raising their fists at the Olymp 1968 Olympic Games. The Tet Offensive has gone off in Vietnam, showing that the U.S. is not all powerful, and it's the beginning of the end of that war. There is a general strike in France, and all the schools now are being run by teachers and students. And here in Seattle, one of the founders of the Black Panther Party comes to your house and says, you are now going to run the first chapter outside of California of the Black Panther Party, and can you fly to New York to get your training this weekend? <laughs> That's where Aaron found himself in 68, and he said what you probably would have said. Uh, yeah, I got to ask my mom. <laughs> I couldn't believe that when I read that, hanging out with him all this time, working on the Senate campaign. And uh, I mean, what an incredible time, how quickly everything was shifting. It's just, it's the inspiration for my life. And I, I couldn't be uh, more honored to have been asked to read from this amazing memoir that I'm so proud of Aaron for finishing and the lessons that I will get and that a whole new generation will get about what it takes to make change uh, in a country that so desperately needs it. So I just want to read you one of the stories that really struck me from this, this book uh, this evening. It actually had my heart pounding when I, when I read it. Um, I'd heard him tell it in the car as we crisscrossed the state on this campaign trail, but uh, just something about the way he put it, uh, to pen was, was just um, really gripping to me, and I, I, I hope you enjoy it. So this is just after he's been selected, and uh, instead of flying to New York, he, he flies to the Bay Area um, to get the ropes of how to be a Black Panther Party member at age 19, and what, what that means, and there's a moment here I want to share with you. He says, we were full of ourselves in uniforms and on our own turf. I was armed, but Orleander was not, as he was underage and not allowed to carry a concealed weapon. Soon, Robert Bay, Tommy, Randy, and Landon came out of the restaurant to see what was going on. The cruiser stopped and Two cops got out looking aloof. Orleander and I backed off the curb and the others moved away from the advancing officers, but Tommy, who earlier had taken a red devil or some other downer, was by this point what Panthers called non-functional. <laughs> he was standing by himself near the curb. One officer asked for his ID while the other returned to the car and called for backup. 
Within five minutes, five police cars were on the scene. Suddenly, the streets began to turn chaotic. People hurried past, whispering among themselves and yelling to others to get out of there. Amid the confusion, Tommy somehow slipped his small, snub-nosed 38 to Orleander. As the police poured out of their cars, hands on their guns, I heard Robert Bay say in his husky voice, spread out. I watched as the others formed a semicircle around Tommy and the cops. I followed suit, taking position next to Robert Bay. Shops and stores in the area closed their doors. People began running. I heard fearful cries and screams. There's going to be a shootout. I'm getting out of here. I remember seeing a young brother, probably a year younger than me, wearing uh, McClumen's high school letterman's jacket, carrying two bags of our groceries in his arms, probably heading for a quiet dinner at home. Our eyes met for a split second, his expression full of fear, my eyes pleading. Stay. Help. He must have read my mind. He sputtered out, man, I would like to stay and help, but I got to get home. In a second, he was gone, leaving me, leaving us, just like all the other people fleeing. The same people for whom we had taken up the banner. The same people we had pledged to defend. The comrades spread out with hands on their guns in that brief second, fear engulfed my entire body. Images of my childhood and my family flashed before me, yet I understood that here on this very corner with my newfound comrades on this fateful night was where I belonged. I placed my hand on my gun in preparation for the worst. Within minutes, the streets were empty except for a few prostitutes who refused to leave, proclaiming loudly, we ain't, gonna, we ain't going nowhere. We're going to stay out here with our brothers. Tommy was arrested, and the seven or eight pigs now bunched together turned their attention to the remaining five of us. For a split second, time seemed to stand still. The Oakland night was deathly quiet. Orleander was standing to my right, legs spread apart, toothpick still dangling out of his mouth, semi-smiling as he always was. Robert Bay to my left looked like an immovable object. Randy stood erect, emotionless, hand on his gun, almost daring the cops to make a move. Landon was out in front, his right hand on that big 44. The pigs, on the other hand, were huddled together on the corner, hesitant, wondering what we were going to do next. That is, all except for the hard-looking lieutenant out in front of his fellow officers. The lieutenant was almost face-to-face -face with Landon, hand on his service revolver. Like Landon, he too probably had been to Vietnam. He blurted out, I'm going to search you. Landon defiantly snapped back, you ain't going to search me. The lieutenant began moving towards Landon. In turn, Landon slowly, carefully backed up. I thought about the TV blown to bits by Landon's 44. The air was thick and heavy and eerily silent. The thoughts of blood and death lingering. The lieutenant repeated his demand to search, and Landon continued to resist. The five of us stood by trying to maintain our defiant postures. Suddenly, while stepping backwards, Landon slipped and stumbled on the lid of a garbage can. The rattling sound reverberated, puncturing the tension and silence. Landon caught himself from falling and quietly bounced, uh, quickly bounced back up, maintaining his position, his hand still on his gun. Then, just when we thought the blood would surely spill and the death would be upon us, the lieutenant 
and the rest of the cops quietly and slowly backed up, silently got into their cars and drove off, making a U-turn beneath the transit construction project and headed back downtown. It was over. The pigs had decided that this warm spring night was not the time they wished to die. And for us, we had chosen this night as our own time to stand our ground. Moments after the pigs left, some prostitute friend of Captain Crutch took our weapons for safekeeping in case the cops came back with reinforcements. We were not, to, uh, we were not about to give up our weapons to the cops, not after what had happened to Bobby Hutton just a few weeks earlier. We split the scene. That night I stayed at the house with Robert Bay, Landon, and Randy. The tension had been so tight. The cops' fear of the, com of the combatants so heavy that whatever rationale they might have given for backing out of this potential bloodbath was understandable. Simply put, we appeared to be more prepared to sacrifice our lives than they were. This was our street, our community. As Panthers, we had drawn the line in the sand. Although I was grateful to have escaped that potential gun battle, I felt proud of myself. I also felt this experience forever cemented my relationship with these four comrades. Thank you, and I just want to say that I think as a new generation of people search for answers about how we make change, you know, many of us hoped that change would come four years ago, and people are still looking for it. And now we hear from Romney saying that 40% of the people are in t feel they're entitled, right? They're entitled to health care, food, and housing, and you name it. Aaron Dixon was in a, an organization that named it. And the 10th point of the Panther program said, we want land, bread, housing, education, uh, clothing, justice, and peace. And I, I'm proud to, to be a friend of Aaron Dixon. I'd like to begin by uh, thanking uh, Aaron Dixon for giving me the honor of introducing him to all uh, of you. Uh, but I want to begin by reinforcing a little bit more about what Ms. Thomas just said, that this here African American Museum is a people center. Uh, untold dozens of groups, they're supposed to pay 50, 100, 150 to use this room, and the women and men who run this institution, if you don't have the bread, to pay and you genuinely want to have a family reunion, you want to bring all the folks in your workforce together where you can talk about what needs to uh, be changed, if you want to invite 50 other community organizations to talk about how we're going to empower uh, the people in our respective uh, communities, the, the Northwest African American Museum is always available, so let's give them a hand. Aaron Dixon in his book, My People Are Rising, talks about a very important time to remember, basically 1968 to 1978. Matter of fact, a time to remember up until just about six months ago uh, was going to be uh, the name uh, of this book. Uh, after I read it for the first time, I thought it should be called uh, the Last Panther Standing. I'm serious, and I'm going to tell you why, and then we're going to bring uh, Aaron forward. Um, Aaron, uh, as was indicated, joined the Black Panther, uh, was a, a, a founder of the Seattle chapter of the Black Panther Party, which was the first uh, organ uh, organization uh, or chapter formed and recognized by the national leadership outside the state of California. And in mid-April 1968, 
uh, Bobby Seal came up here, uh, who was the chairman of the Black Panthers, of course, at that time, and uh, met with about 50 to 60 young African Americans. Many of us, about half of us, had already, uh, just two weeks before that, uh, gone to a West Coast Black Student Union Conference at San Francisco uh, State University. Uh, where, and San Francisco, San Francisco State University was the first black student union uh, in the country, and it was very revolutionary. And by, that, by the time we went down there, many of the members of the Black Student Union there were also uh, members of the San Francisco, Oakland, or Richmond chapters of the Black Panther Party. Uh, so they had gotten their chairman, uh, Bobby Seale, to be the keynote speaker uh, for all us black students that had come. It was 30 of us from Seattle. No speaker had uh, the kind of impact on our spirit, our souls, our emotions, and our desire to join the black power movement and be more uh, meaningfully involved in it than the comments and rhetoric and teachings of Bobby Seale. Unfortunately, that was the same weekend that the first Panther had been uh, murdered, uh, little Bobby Seale, and we were all invited to go to his I'm Bobby, I'm sorry, little Bobby Hutton, I'm sorry. Uh, and we were all invited to Oakland to go to his funeral, and uh, uh, all of us did. And again, the Black Panthers had a tremendously deep, it's hard to express, a profound impact on the young uh, Black Power uh, youth uh, that were there from uh, Seattle. And right then, somehow, Aaron and E.J. Brisker and some of the other brothers and sisters uh, figured out a way to get a meeting with Bobby Seale. And uh, he made a commitment then, after just meeting us once, to come up to Seattle and uh, see whether or not he was going to allow a Black Panther Party outside of uh, California to be started. So that was the beginning. Aaron stayed in the Black Panther Party, as all of y'all will find out from reading this book, until well into 1978. And uh, at the height of the Black Panther parties, there were uh, hundreds of chapters across the country and tens of thousands of members. By the time Aaron Dixon uh, left the uh, main headquarters of the Black Panther Party in uh, Northern California, uh, there were probably just a couple hundred. So this is one of the few uh, Panthers that was that was there from the beginning uh, to the end. And many of you see our lights. One of the things that occurred in 1968 uh, was that uh, the white power structure in Seattle, Washington was aghast. They just couldn't believe that their Negroes would become involved in the black power movement. And Aaron talks about uh, the metaphor metaphors of the, or changes in the black community and the, the most profound one that he talks about, and I had not remembered it until he mentions it in his book, was the visit of uh, Stokely Carmichael uh, in April of 1967, who uh, spoke, spoke at Garfield High School to 2,000 black people, most of whom, when we went in there, if you'd have asked us what we were, we would have said Negroes. Two hours and nine minutes later, <laughs> this is the truth, and Aaron talks about uh, all the blacks at Garfield uh, came out of that uh, Garfield gymnasium and saying, we are black and proud and we want black power. That's the profound impact that that speech has. But the conditions in Seattle is what made that ready change uh, occur so rapidly. In Seattle, Washington in 1968, 50% of the black people in uh, this community we're living at or below the poverty level. 88% of us were forced to all live in the central area of Seattle uh, because of housing uh, discrimination. Those of us that didn't live in the central area lived in the housing projects, High Point, Yesla Terrace, Rainier Vista, uh, and uh, one more, is Rainier, huh? Oh, Holly Park, it's called New Holly now. Uh, so the fifth, all, 
All the black students went to 14 or 15 schools in the central area uh, where the scores on standardized tests were poor than anywhere else uh, in the city and we're not allowed to teach black history. We have not had one black uh, staff or hired to be an administrator in any school district, uh, any high school in Seattle uh, by 1968. Uh, but that changed with the creation of the Black Student Union uh, that started at the University of Washington where Aaron and I and 12 other folks, there's about 14 people. Miss Day is here, she was one of the original founders. Gary Owens came that year or the next, is also in the audience. And the, pan, uh, the Black Student Union at the University of Washington, it, it was the entity that organized the trip to the Black Student Union Conference in March that led to the founding of the Black Panther Party. The first meeting was held at Aaron Dixon's house. Bobby Seals chose Aaron uh, to be the leader, not because we were meeting at his house, but just in, within a couple hours, he was able to sense that this guy was serious. He was disciplined. Uh, he didn't talk a lot. Matter of fact, Aaron uh, felt kind of uncomfortable being a, a public speaker uh, in the early days of the uh, Black Panthers. When he could, he'd ask his brother, and I don't know if his brother's here, uh, Elmer. Elmer just came in. He would ask Elmer uh, to do the speaking, and Elmer just came in. He's probably coming from speaking and warring uh, thousands of people somewhere around our country uh, because he's a nationally known diversity uh, speaker. But Aaron was the thinker and the practitioner for the Black Panther Party here in Seattle. He's the one that led the effort to come up with concrete strategies to serve the people. He was the one that helped us start the first uh, uh, food banks uh, in anywhere in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, he was the one that said, let's get together and figure out how we can provide direct medical services to the poor children in the center, and he was the one that went out and got the, uh, got the doctors and nurses to volunteer. When people start saying we're tired of the rats and roaches, he was the one to say let's set up an extermination program. Forget that we don't have the money, we'll get the tools together, and he figured out a way for us to get it. So without further ado, I hope I've given you a sense of the man and the personality and a truly revolutionary person uh, from our community that wrote this outstanding book, My People Are Rising. Here is Aaron Dixon. Uh, this book is, was really, really important to me. It was just speaking to me all the time. Uh, this was something I had to write because there, it was such a powerful time. It was such a magnificent time. It was probably one of the, 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 the most exciting, probably the one, one of the most dynamic times in modern American history for not just America, but particularly for black Americans. And, uh, you know, Bobby Seale says uh, that the Black Panther Party was, a, was, a, was an accident, but it, it was not an accident. You know, it, all the things, all the pieces had come together. You know, because my generation, we were a generation that was very much connected to history. I lived in the house of my great-great-grandmother in Chicago for a small period of time. And she was born in 1867. And, you know, we, we heard her stories. We listened to her stories. We listened to the stories of my grandparents on, on both sides, my, my mother's parents and my father's parents. We listened to the stories of our parents. And, and we, knew, uh, we knew where we came from. We knew the struggles of our people. We knew the racism and, and the things that they had to fight and the things that they had to co contend with. So, um, so, you know, we were part of the oral tradition. The oral tradition doesn't exist anymore, unfortunately, but we were still part of that oral tradition. And that oral tradition is when the elders uh, and all of them, the aunts and uncles and everybody, every chance they had, they would tell the children. They would tell the children about what they had went through. Yeah. They would tell the children about the adversities and, and, and the accomplishments. And they were constantly doing this, and, and they did this for a reason. And so, you know, growing up in that type of environment, that really prepared my generation, you know, to, to uh, 
to be ready when 1967 and 1968 came, came about. And then, you know, um, you had the Vietnam War that was taking place. You had uh, uh, many of the uh, countries in Africa were uh, fighting for their freedom and overthrowing their colonial rulers. Uh, in South America, you had the same thing. You had Che Guevara and Fidel Castro that had recently uh, marched on, uh, on Havana and uh, taken control of Havana for the people. Um, and so all of, all of these things were fresh in our mind. You know, revolution was the word of the day because revolution was taking place all over the world. Every major country in, in the world at that time, young people were rising up. And they were rising up and they were seizing control. And they were saying that they wanted a better world. They wanted to create a better world. And that's really what the Black Panther Party was really about. But the Black Panther Party was a phenomenal organization. There was, there was uh, many great leaders of the Black Panther Party. And I know some of them have, are, are mainline now because of, of, of things. But each one of the leaders of the Black Panther Party um, was, was was uh, special, you know, they had something very unique and very special to offer uh, the movement. Uh, Eldridge, uh, Huey, Bobby, Emery Douglas. Uh, uh, the word I really want to use is genius. Each last one of them had a particular genius to them. And, um, and all the young people that came about now, uh, what caused me to join the Black Panther Party was I was sitting in the King County Jail with uh, Larry Gossett and uh, Carl Miller. <laughs> and uh, we had just been arrested for the sit-in at Franklin High School. And, uh, and later on that evening, Walter Conkright comes on the radio, and he's, he announces that Martin Luther King had been assassinated. Well, this was devastating news for us, devastating because Martin Luther King was a true champion of the people. He was a true lover, he was a man of love, he was a man of peace. And uh, I had marched with Martin Luther King when I was very young, I think I was about 12 or 13 years old. Uh, but also we were really angry because we were locked up in jail and we could not be out on the streets protesting and, 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 and letting our rage out at the, at the murder of, of a very peaceful and a very loving man. But I remember late that night going back to my cell, uh, and I remember lying there, and I remember saying that, and I had participated in, in, in marches and demonstrations and all of those things, but I, I remember saying to myself that uh, they killed a man of peace, so now we have to do something else. We have to look for sterner stuff. Or we have to protect ourselves, and we have to protect our people. And I decided right then and right there that the picket sign that I once carried was going to be replaced by a gun. And I didn't realize that all across the country, young people were saying the same thing all across the country. I mean, black, Latino, Asian, Native American, and white youth were saying the same thing all across the country. Because you've got to remember, it just wasn't the Black Panther Party that the uh, struggles of the 60s was about, but there were a whole host of organizations. There was the Brown Berets, which was a Latino organization. There was the Black Berets, which was also a Latino revolutionary organization. There was the Red Guard, made of Chinese and Japanese. There were uh, uh, AIM, the American Indian Movement. There was uh, um, SDS, and uh, later the Weathermen. There was the uh, Young Patriot Party, which was made up of uh, poor whites from the Appalachians. And so, uh, you know, we all uh, coalesced and we all came together to really change America and really make America a place for, for everybody. But we knew it was going to be a sacrifice. We knew it was going to be a sacrifice and we knew that blood was going to be shed and we were willing to shed our blood at, at any cost. Um, but the Black Panther Party had many, many accomplishments, many accomplishments. Uh, of course, that first year, you know, in 68, we did carry guns. We carried guns up and down the street. We, first of all, it was, it was legal to do so, and we wanted to let the community know that they had a right to protect themselves, and we wanted to let the police know that we were going to protect the community from now on because they weren't doing a very good job of it. So we were going to step in, and we were going to do it. Um, so um, 
you know, after, by 1969, we realized we had to uh, do other things and, and help our community, that we were really separating ourselves from, from the community by our uniforms and, and the weapons that we were carrying. And the beautiful thing about the Black Panther Party, now when Bobby Seale first came to Seattle, he said, uh, he told us, there were t 25 young people that he said that to, in order to join the Black Panther Party, you had to have two weapons and 2,000 rounds of ammunition. <laughs> he also told us that you had to read two hours a day and you had to have political education class once a week. And he gave us a book list of 25 books and told us that we had to start reading those books and we had to study. And that's what we did. We studied and, uh, and, and we practiced. Um, so the Black Panther Party was always changing. We never were the same organization that we were uh, two years prior. We were always changing because we understood that nothing stood outside of change and that we could not remain stagnant, that in order for us to be successful, we had to, uh, to constantly change and adapt ourselves to the situation. So in 1969, when um, uh, the Vietnam War had began to take a lot of the resources from home and a lot of people were laid off from Boeing and, and a lot of people were poor, a lot of people were going to, a lot of kids were going to school hungry. We had to create some programs. First of all, we knew we had to win the people over and we weren't gonna win them over necessarily by carrying our guns up and down the street. That we had to really uh, serve them. We had to really provide things for them that they needed that, that weren't being provided. So one of the first programs that we did initiate was the free breakfast for school children program. And we initiated that all across the country. And uh, you know our orders came from central headquarters and they told us, okay, we want you guys to start a free breakfast for school children program. Now that, that didn't go over to, for a lot of, for some of the comrades because a lot of people joined the party for a lot of different reasons. And, and some you know, joined, they thought they were just going to be you know, in combat with the police all the time. But uh, in reality, that, that was not reality. And so uh, we, we had to start, uh, start this breakfast program. So we opened five breakfast program locations. My brother, Elmer, he was coordinating the breakfast program at that time. And so we opened up a, a breakfast program in every major housing project in the city of Seattle. And what the breakfast program basically was, you know, you had little kids going to school hungry every day. And we said, how can little Johnny learn that five oranges and four oranges are nine oranges? He hasn't even had an orange. <laughs> so we went to community centers. We went to churches that were near elementary schools. Um, and this was one of the first, this uh, Coleman Elementary School was one of the first breakfast programs that we opened. Uh, Ike Akita, um, who ran Atlantic Street Center, he was a, one of the first persons that opened the doors to the concept of the breakfast program. A lot of the black churches were, would not let us use the churches, uh, but we're, we're thankful that Ike Akita opened the doors for us at Atlantic Street Center, and we launched the first breakfast program. And you know, Panthers would get up at six in the morning. They would go down to the uh, community centers, wherever they were, and we would prepare breakfast. And the kids would come in and eat breakfast. And uh, you know, Elmer would uh, be out during the day collecting donations, going to uh, Gay's Bakery and wherever we can get uh, get money and, and get food for the breakfast programs. Um, and uh, then. Uh, one of the beautiful things that happened with the breakfast program, and I just met somebody tonight who told me that her mother worked in the breakfast program in Holly Park. But one of the, a unique thing happened is a lot of the welfare mothers started coming down to the breakfast program and asked what they could do to help. And so pretty soon they took over the breakfast program. All we had to do was make sure the food was there. And they prepared it, and they cleaned up, and they sent the kids on the way. And what this did was this empowered a lot of those mothers. It empowered them to take uh, uh, action in their community and, and empowered them to take action in their own lives and work towards achieving a lot of the goals that they had, uh, had neglected. Um, so uh, shortly after we started the breakfast program, we started another program called the, uh, the, free, um, the, the free Medical Clinic. This was the first free medical clinic in the Northwest, and we opened up the Sydney Miller Free Medical Clinic. 
Um, and uh, there was a, a, a doctor named John Green who was a neurosurgeon at, um, at the University of Washington. And he just showed up at our office and said, I'm gonna be you guys' doctor. And one of the first uh, things that he had to deal with was the comrade that shot himself in the foot. Uh, so uh, that was one of, the, one of the first things that Dr. John Green dealt with. But when we got the order to open up a medical clinic, we charged full steam ahead with developing this concept of the medical clinic. And we got doctors to volunteer their time, we got nurses to volunteer their time, we got community people to volunteer their time. Dr. John Green would let us back up uh, his van. We'd take his van down to the University of Washington Hospital and he told us, you guys wait here. And he would go in there and do whatever he was doing. And, <laughs> and we start loading up, loading up. <laughs> so um, it, was, it was a very short time before we had our medical clinic open. Um, and uh, like I said, it was the first community medical clinic in the Northwest, because at that time, there were no small community clinics. They didn't right. exist. And so we laid the foundation for community clinics. That's why we have community clinics today, uh, is because of what the Black Panther Party did. But we went on to start many, many, many programs. We, we had the uh, free legal aid program, uh, which we had lawyers come down to our community center, twice a day, uh, twice a week to volunteer their time for people who could not afford uh, uh, to see an attorney. They could come to our community center and they could meet with an attorney and the attorney would give them advice or representation if they needed that. Um, and then uh, we started the uh, first uh, food bank. It was a Black Panther Party that started the first food bank. We started giving out bags of groceries out of our office every once a week, every Wednesday. We gave out bags of groceries. Um, then we started what was called the Liberation School. They did not have uh, summer programs for working parents at that time. So we started what was called the Liberation School um, and, and, and we started it at Rainier Vista. And parents could drop their kids off to the Liberation School during the summer and we provided breakfast, we provided lunch, we took them on field trips, and uh, we educated them, and uh, we did a lot of things with the kids, and, and a lot of young people grew up in that liberation school. Uh, but we went on to start so many, many programs. It would take me a long time to really uh, talk about those, all those programs, but um, uh, being in the Black Panther Party was a lot of work. You know, we got up at six in the morning after being on guard duty. Everybody had to be on guard duty uh, for two hours, because the police and the FBI were trying to kill us. They were trying to annihilate us. And so we had to fortify our offices. We had to take weapons training. We had to make sure everybody knew how to use a weapon. Everybody had to do security two hours a night from 10 to 12, 12 to 2, 2 to 4, 4 to 6. 6 o'clock, everybody had to get up and get ready and go out to the breakfast program. They went out to the breakfast program and served the kids. They came back. They cleaned themselves up, and they had to go out in the field and sell Black Panther newspapers because the Black Panther newspaper was so important to us. And, it, and the Black Panther Party newspaper was one of the most beautiful and one of the most powerful newspapers in the world. We had a circulation of 350,000 newspapers, Black Panther Party newspapers worldwide. And, uh, and, and we understood that the paper was the voice of the party and it also was the voice of the people. So everybody had to go out and sell 100 Black Panther newspapers every day, except for Sunday. So when people came, and then the people who coordinated the programs, the breakfast program, the liberation school, the free bus and the prison program, they would have to take time off uh, and, uh, and, and work on their programs, make, they had, make sure they had everything they needed for their programs. Um, and then we would come, uh, they, the, the people would come in from the field and, and dinner would be prepared. And then we'd have political education class or weapons class. And then, uh, you know, um, we would have a little bit of time for some recreation. And then, uh, you know, people went to bed and then there were people who had to do security. But we did not realize that J. Edgar Hoover, Attorney General John Mitchell and um, Richard Nixon had created a plan to destroy the Black Panther Party.
called COINTELPRO, but we did not realize that they had set 1969 as the period that they would have the Black Panther Party wiped out. We did not know that. We did not know that they were going to try to wipe us out by 1969. Uh, one night, one day in September, uh, we got a call from a black gentleman who worked for the Justice Department. He wanted to meet with Elmer and I. And uh, we said, no, we don't want to meet with anybody from the Justice Department. But he kept calling back. And he called back, um, and he said it's a matter of life and death. So we decided that we had to go meet him. So Elmer and I went down, and we met him on the corner of where the federal building was. And he told us that the, uh, that the FBI had plans to raid our office and to kill us. And so with that information, we began to fortify our office. But we didn't know that there was a memo sent out by J. Edgar Hoover that said that he wanted three chapters destroyed. He wanted Chicago, he wanted LA, and he wanted Seattle chapters destroyed. We did not know that. And so with that memo, uh, on, the, on, on the morning of December 4th, probably one of the saddest days for me in the Black Panther Party. Um, there was a young man named Fred Hampton. If you guys don't know who Fred Hampton is, please, when you get home, get on the computer and look, and look up Fred Hampton. Fred Hampton, along with uh, Bobby Rush, was the founder of the Chicago chapter of the Black Panther Party. He was only 19 years old. He was the same age as I was. And, um, and one of the first things that Fred Hampton did was he went down to the black gangster disciples and the Blackstone Rangers and told them that uh, they were going to have to stop fighting each other. See, I, I'm, we're from Chicago, so we knew about the Blackstone Rangers and the, and the black gangster disciples uh, and, and how those gangs were. So Fred told them, you have to stop fighting each other. And as a result, the, now the FBI did not want this alliance to take place, so they did everything they could to make sure it didn't. So the, the Blackstone Rangers decided to join the Black Panther Party. They changed their name to the Black Peacestone Nation and began to work with the Black Panther Party. But Jeff Fort, who was head of the uh, 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 Gangster Disciples, uh, opted out in, in this coalition. Um, the next thing that Fred Hampton did was he went down to the uh, Latino community, the Puerto Rican community, where Cha Cha Jimenez and a gang called the Young Lords were active. He went down to meet and met with them. Uh, he went down, and then he went down and met with, uh, in, the, in the poor white community of Chicago, and he met with the poor whites there, and uh, with a brother named Slim, and, uh, and formed a, a coalition, the Rainbow Coalition. This was the first Rainbow Coalition, and it was Fred Hampton, not Jesse Jackson, that started the Rainbow <laughs> Coalition, okay? So uh, with, with the forming of the Rainbow Coalition, this meant that Mayor Daley, who had been the mayor of Chicago since the 30s, would, would be challenged. He would be challenged. And he did not want this. And so uh, Fred Hampton had a target on his head. Fred Hampton was fastly a rising star on the revolutionary, in the revolutionary world of America. He was getting speaking engagements in Europe and in Canada. He was going to be appointed to the Central Committee. He was going to be the first non-California to be appointed uh, to the Central Committee of the Black Panther Party. And I had a chance to speak on the platform with Fred Hampton at the University of Chicago in the winter of 1968. And anybody who met Fred Hampton, when you met him, you walked away and you said, this is a very special young man. And when he spoke, he spoke like Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, all rolled into one. He, uh, he, was, he was a tireless. He, this man was so dedicated to, to what he was doing that his comrades in Chicago had to tie him down in a chair, tie him down so he could get some rest, so he could get some rest. You know, he would have all the Panthers in Chicago. He would have them up at 6 in the morning. He would have them at the park. He would have him exercising and doing calisthenics, and he would be doing the call and response. He would say, I am a revolutionary, and the comrades would say back, I am a revolutionary. He said, I will die for the people, and the comrades would say back, I will die for the people. Fred Hampton was, was, was an amazing person. But on the morning of December 4th, 
the ATF and the Chicago Police Department uh, burst into Fred's home and murdered him. And what had happened was Fred had been up meeting with his staff to about two in the morning, and and you know this is what we did. We we worked and we met. And when it was time to go to sleep, we went to sleep wherever we were. We didn't need a bed. We didn't need pajamas. We didn't need none of those things. We just went to sleep on a table, chairs, floor, wherever. So Fred met with his staff. Now, his security uh, person was an FBI informant. And he had given the layout to Fred Hampton's pad to the uh, ATF. He had also put some Sicanol in Fred's drink, which is a derivative that's in Red Devils that makes you go to sleep and makes you real laid back. And so at, there was a knock on the door at 4 in the morning, and Mark Clark, 19-year-old captain of Pure, Illinois, went to the door with a shotgun to his own security. He said, who is it? A shot ran out, rang out, and it killed Mark Clark instantly. Simultaneously, the uh, ATF, Chicago police, burst through the rear doors with uh, Thompson submachine guns. They burst through the front door. They went in the living room. They got all the Panthers that were asleep. They lined them against the wall, machine gunned them. They went into Fred Hampton's room. His wife, who was six months pregnant, shook him, tried to wake him. Fred, Fred, wake up. But he had been drugged, and he could not wake up. And the, and the police lowered their guns and shot him while he was asleep. Shot him while he was asleep. That's how much afraid they were of this young man, Fred Hampton, that they killed him while in his, in his sleep. And when June Hillier, the assistant chief of staff, called me that morning, and told me that Fred Hampton died, it was, it, was, it was one of the most heaviest feelings that I would ever feel in the Black Panther Party. I had already been to Bunchy Carter's funeral. I had already been to a whole bunch of funerals. There had, there had already been a lot of deaths in the Black Panther Party, but Fred Hampton's was the heaviest because I knew what he, who he was, and I knew that if he had lived, he would have been a, a, a great contributor to humankind. Two days later, the ATF go to L.A. Now, the L.A. Panthers were very military-minded. They had the most Vietnam vets, and because of the uh, ferociousness of the L.A. The police department, the L.A. Panthers were some of the baddest, excuse me, some of the baddest niggas in America, okay? <laughs> so uh, they knew that a raid was coming, so they had built a uh, bunker inside their office. And they took all the chairs and all the desks and put them on each side of the door so that they knew that the SWAT team, now the SWAT team came about because of the Black Panther Party. They knew that when the SWAT team came in, you know, they're going to bust through the door, they're going to go to the left, and they're going to go to the right. Well, on this occasion, they came and they cordoned the whole area off for almost a mile. They kicked people out of their homes and they had an anti uh, 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 anti-tank uh, uh, had a tank. They had a tank out there. They had helicopters, and they began an assault on, on, on Central Avenue uh, office of the Black Panther Party of Los Angeles. And uh, they burst through the door, and they couldn't go right, and they couldn't go left, and the Panthers opened up and blew them right out, back, right out the door. And they had a shootout that lasted for over eight hours. And when the sunlight was up and, and all the people came out on the streets, the, uh, the, the Panthers, uh, many of them were wounded. They put up the white flag and surrendered because they knew that this was time for them to surrender. And they were all arrested and charged with attempted murder. Uh, two days later, the ATF comes to Seattle, and they go to Mayor Wes Oman, and they tell Wes Oman that they have, Panthers have automatic weapons in there. And the, and the mayor tells him, well, my informant tells me that they don't have any automatic weapons. See, Mayor of West Omen, you know, Seattle being the small community as it, as it was, and everybody knew who we were, and, you know, we were doing so much in the community. You know, everybody knew who the Black Panther Party was. They, they knew our names. And, and he, know, he knew that he did not want what happened in Chicago or what ha happened in L.A. to be on his hands. He had a conscience, and he was not going to let that happen. And he told them, he told the ATF, is I'm not going to allow you to go up there and kill them. And so as a result, the ATF had to, uh, had to, had to, to abort that plan uh, because they, we know that they wanted to come in and kill us. Now, we had heavily fortified our office. Our, 
We had double sandbags all the way up to the ceiling. We had steel on the doors and we had uh, <clears throat> put steel in between plywood and we had gas masks. Elmer and I got our financial aid checks, our last financial aid check from the U <laughs> University of Washington, about $1,400. <clears throat> and all of our money, all of our money went on guns and, and gas masks and bulletproof vests. <laughs> So there's, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's many stories that I could tell, uh, but you have to read the book. But even my book doesn't really capture the, the, the tremendous amount of stories that exist in the Black Panther Party and all of the work and the sacrifices that members of the Black Panther Party did. And, um, you know, I'm just, I'm glad that I'm survived and I'm just really, really happy to see so many comrades here, you know, because, you know, we had a love for, our, for each other. We had a, a true love for each other. And I write in the book at uh, Black Panther Party, it replaced my family. They had become my family. You know, they had become my new family. And, you know, we, we were willing to die for one, for one another. And we, we really loved one another. We truly loved each other. And we were willing to do anything that we uh, could do uh, for one another. And that was one of the most beautiful parts of being in the Black Panther Party. Uh, so I think um, I'm going to uh, end, but I, I, there's one person that I forgot to thank, and that is uh, Deborah Green, the wife of Dr. John Green. Because uh, you want to stand, Deborah, for a minute, if you don't mind? <laughs> Now, uh, De Deborah helped me get my manuscript completed. She did the first editing of my manuscript, and she helped me get it into a finished product, even though I pretty much threw it in the garbage can and had to rewrite it over again. But she helped me get there, and, I, and I'm, I'm really thankful for her for helping me do that. Um, so I think now, I think we, we need to have some time for a question and answer periods. So uh, I want to thank again everybody for coming out, and we're going to open it up for question and answers. Thank you. No questions? <laughs> Yes. 20th, 20th and Spruce, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, now he's talking about the mural that's on 20th and Spruce. If you haven't seen it, you should go see it. But that's where our community center was. We opened that community center in September of 1969. And uh, that's, that's, where, that's the place where we had our fortification. That's where we opened up the first free medical clinic. That's where we started our food bank. Uh, that's where we started our, our legal aid program and many, many other programs. And, uh, and when we did finally decide to move out of there, you know, they, they had to tear it down because it, it, it was, I'm sorry, it was a fort. <laughs> it was a fort. But uh, 20th and Spruce, yes, that, that, that's it. Okay. Okay, so uh, um, you know, the, the, when we first started the clinic, we named it after Sidney Miller. Sidney Miller was a uh, Black Panther Party member from Chicago who was uh, killed in a very tragic uh, incident. Um, and we named the clinic after Sidney Miller. Um, uh, later on, around 1974, we, there was a young lady that joined the Black Panther Party. Her name was Carolyn Downs. and she. Uh, dedicated herself to working in the clinic. And um, unfortunately, unfortunately, she passed away of cancer, and so we named the clinic Carolyn Downs Clinic, and we created the nonprofit program called Sidney Miller um, Nonprofit Organization. And the clinic is still open today, right there on Yesler, Carolyn Downs. This, there's one of, one of two Black Panther clinics that are still open to this very day. What's, what's the other one? Uh, in Portland. Portland, Oregon's clinic is still open. 
Yes. Uh, thank you, sir. When I was much younger, I read a history of the underground press in America uh, with regard to the frequency of these publications, uh, weekly and monthly, bi-monthly. They quoted, uh, not by name, but they quoted a panther working very carefully on the, on the Black Panther allegory who said, it's a weekly man, it's just that some weeks are uh, longer than others. <laughs> and I was wondering uh, if you could talk a little bit more about the paper and what it meant to the party. And I was wondering, did the ups and downs of the paper coincide with the ups and downs of the party or sometimes the discord? No, there was only one time, one small period when the paper did not come out. That's when Eldridge Cleaver, the Minister of Information, was, uh, was, was locked away uh, because he was, he was the force behind the newspaper at that time. And when he was arrested, the, the, the paper lay dormant for, for a month or two. But after that, the paper came out on time every week. And when the paper first started, uh, Panthers from all across the country would send in articles, would send in pictures uh, to central headquarters. And central headquarters would do the layout of the newspaper. Comrades would, who worked on the newspaper, they stayed up uh, for two or three nights doing the layout of the newspaper. And, uh, and then once the paper was laid out, they would take it to the print, printers and, and, and it would be printed and they, the paper would be delivered to a uh, distribution center in San Francisco. And, uh, and every Wednesday night, Panthers would come from all over the Bay Area and they would work on boxing the newspapers and rolling up the individual pieces of newspapers and shipping those newspapers all over the world. And that was a tradition. That became a tradition, a Black Panther Party tradition. We would be there from 8 in the evening till 5 in the morning getting the papers prepared. Now, the FBI did uh, a lot of things to try to stop the paper from coming out. You know, sometimes Panthers from different cities would go to pick the newspaper up and the, uh, the papers would be burned, they would be soaking wet, they would disappear, they wouldn't be there. So there was a lot of tactics they were doing that showed you how valuable the paper was, that they were trying all kinds of things to keep this paper from coming out. They would arrest Panthers uh, while they were out selling the newspaper. Uh, whoops, I guess that did something. So, um, <laughs> So what the Black Panther Party did, see the Black Panther Party was, you know, we were all, we were dialectical thinkers. We were always thinking ahead. And so to combat what the, uh, what the uh, uh, FBI was doing, we decided and that instead of shipping the papers from San Francisco, we would have someone, we would have a Panther take the prints and fly to Chicago and fly to New York and we would have them printed there. And from there they would be distributed where they needed to be distributed. Um, you know, the, 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 the party had, the, the newspaper had, had went through a lot of different cycles. When we went through the centralization and all the chapters and branches moved to uh, Oakland, the, uh, the, the newspaper became a very refined newspaper. And David Du Bois was chosen uh, by Huey to be the editor of the Black Panther newspaper. And, we, and all the best uh, photographers, all the best writers, came to Oakland to central headquarters and they worked on the newspaper. And uh, so if, if you ever get a chance to look at like a paper from 1968 uh, and a paper in 1974, you will see the difference in how the paper e evolved. It was always an evolving process. Um, there's a story that Bobby Seale tells me that uh, in, in South Africa, uh, when ANC, when the ANC fighters came in from the bush, uh, they would come into their office and there would be a box of liquor in one corner and a, and a box of Black Panther papers in the other. They went to the Black Panther papers <laughs> because they knew they were getting the righteous information from the Black Panther newspapers. Yes. This year, 2012, is a very scary year. We're seeing an upsurge in lynching in America, particularly lynching of black people.
question is, what does your book and what do you propose uh, to do today? <laughs> Well, you know, I'm not a politician anymore, and I, 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 I can't stand up here and say what I propose to do because it, I really don't know. I really don't know. The only thing that I felt that I needed to do was write this book, and I wrote this book for the young people and the generations that's coming up. I wrote this book to inspire them because now it's up to them. It's up to them to figure out what needs to be done and how it's going to be done. and, and, and uh, and I, I think that uh, there's a lot of life left uh, in, in the young people here. There's a lot of, lot of, lot of life left, uh, left in, in us former members of the Black Panther Party as well. And we will always be there to lend our wisdom and our knowledge and our assistance to the young people. Yes, I'm going to get to you. Yes. Uh, have you ever uh, been wounded? Oh, I see your arm, your left arm looks like there's something yeah. wrong with you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, that's LJ, that's LJ. He was one of the young men that I worked with at Sharpless High School. I'm so glad to see him. A lot of the young people that I've worked with are here today, but thanks LJ for asking that. And uh, you know, there were a couple of uh, uh, attempts on my life. There was, in, 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 in regards to his question, um, I had bought a shotgun in Oakland, California. It was a Riot 18 with a bayonet attachment. And, um, and uh, one day, uh, uh, Big Malcolm, Malcolm Williams, who was also a member of the Black Panther Party, we decided that uh, we, we needed to go out and make sure all the weapons were working, uh, in working order. So we loaded all the weapons up in the step van, and uh, we headed out to the Green River to try to find a nice spot. We smoked some hash on the way. Um, <laughs> We got out to the Green River and we unloaded the weapon and we started, you know, shooting them. We started test firing every weapon. And the last weapon that we test fired was my shotgun, the Riot 18. And Malcolm said, man, that's yours. You go ahead and fire. So I put it up to my shoulder, uh, but there was a voice that whispered in my ear that said, don't fire from your shoulder. Uh, I looked at my watch. I had this uh, young prostitute, and we, we did a lot to help the prostitutes in the community. Whenever Elmer and I would see the prostitutes down on Yesler, we saw young girls that we knew that went to school, we would get them and we would send them home. Uh, there's a whole chapter in there, in, in the book, that talks about uh, our relationship with the pimps, which wasn't cordial, and how we worked to get these girls off the streets. But there was a young lady who did, took, she took her pimp's watch it was a gold watch with um, jade in it, and she gave it to me. And I remember looking at that watch before I fired the shotgun. And so I put it down to my uh, hip, and I pulled the trigger. And when I pulled the trigger, the firing pin, uh, as soon as the firing pin hit the uh, primer, the shotgun exploded, and, and my arm was almost blown off. And, um, and, uh, you know, we were able, Malcolm, we were able to get to the hospital and, uh, and the doctor said, had I not smoked the hash, then I would have died because I would have lost a lot of blood. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, but, uh, so, but, but the significance of this is we took the shotgun shells, Elmer and my father took the shotgun shells down and had them tested. And what they found out was the gunpowder had been taken out and high explosive had been put in the place of the gunpowder. And I had a bandolier of shotgun shells. Everybody knew that that was my personal bandolier. Somebody got hold of it, I don't know who. And, uh, and, and that's what happened. That's, that's how my arm got almost destroyed. And they wanted to amputate it. They wanted to amputate it. My mother said no. My mother said, you are not going to amputate his arm. <laughs> Thank you, Mom. <laughs> Next question. Right. Oh, the last chance, the last chance I had to hear you speak was on a panel right here, and I came late, so I didn't get the chance to hear what I hear tonight about how the massacre in Chicago for the Black Panther Party. I did a little research on that. That's the reason why I posed that question. And my question was, I don't know if you remember it or not, was 
the Black Panther Party here in Seattle, the same Black Panther Party that was connected to the Black Panther Party that was in Illinois and massacred and things. Because I did research and I heard of the connection they had with the Gangster Disciples, the, the street organization. And you had a chance to speak on that and you said, yeah. you said, you said, you said, uh, you cleared the water a little bit, you say, wait a minute, because I was an organization member at that time. A lot of us was organization members. But we put an end to organization, street life, meaning organization, when we became a black panther, a legal black panther party member. So gang members was absolute. It wasn't until they crushed the black panther party is when the members pull their flags back out and say, man, we're going back to the street. Yeah. The drug of choice at that time, you say, was cocaine. I say right now, and hopefully your book would uh, agree with this, I say it's a new day. Let's try it again. These young people that's killing themselves on the street would be glad to put their flags away if you organize, like the Black Panther Party, put money in their pocket, they'll be glad to put pistol down I would hope so, but uh, you bring up an a inter interesting point, is that during the whole era of the Black Panther Party, gang warfare in America came to a standstill. And he's right. It wasn't until 1980s, when the Black Panther Party was no longer around, that you saw the emergence of the gangs again. Because we, we would not have allowed that. We would not have allowed it. We would not have allowed crack cocaine to come into our community. I think we got one more question. And one more question. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. I can't say nothing there. Oh, hold on for a minute. Hold on. No. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. So I had to chase Aaron off here for a second before we get the last question because I want everyone to know that the story of his past is absolutely breathtaking to read. Uh, and the struggle that he built, there's so many lessons from, but Aaron has not given up, and Aaron isn't done fighting, and people should know that this fall, Aaron is getting ready to go on a trip to Palestine. We, we haven't done, we're not done learning from Aaron, and I went on this trip last year, it's, a, it's the African Heritage Delegation uh, to Palestine to make connections between the Jim Crow segregation that African Americans have faced here in the United States and the segregation uh, that Palestinians face as well. And he's going to come back and share the story of black uh, and Palestinian solidarity here in Seattle. And I think all of us should help Aaron get there, right? He, he is an incredibly wealthy man when it comes to uh, experience and helping ordinary people, but not when it comes to money in his pocketbook. Uh, so if people could dig deep, if you write a, write a check to Aaron, um, you know, whatever you have to help him get to Palestine, it, it's an expensive trip that costs several thousand dollars for him to get there, but I know we will all be a lot wealthier when he comes back to tell us about uh, how we're going to build solidarity with some of the most oppressed people in the world today. So I'm going to send around. say is that when you uh, undertake the work of trying to change 
society and trying to change the world and making it a better place that it really does take a lot of dedication. You have to really be ready to give your life up. Now, uh, my brothers and I, my brother was going to school, he was going to be a, 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 a neurosurgeon. That's what his dream was, that was the dream of my parents, that he was going to school, go to school and be a neurosurgeon. I was going to be a famous playwright and go to New York and be a famous playwright. We were both in school, you know, and, and a lot of other Panthers were in school and had a lot of dreams, and their parents had a lot of dreams for them. But we, we gave all that up. We, we sacrificed those things because we wanted to change the world. We wanted to make it a better place. So I would say that if you're really going to undertake this type of work, that you really have to be willing to give up everything because that's really what it takes. It takes dedication and it takes sacrifice. Uh, Greg? Now hold on for a minute. Greg. Yeah, I just wanted to just touch on um, some one thing that um, occurred during that era, that the time, the flood of um, heroin into the communities, uh, Robert Vesco and, and, and uh, Nixon administration, and, and then a lot of the revolutionary progressive uh, members of the party and other uh, movements uh, were given psychotic drugs, and some of them we lost forever. And, and um, well, what, what Greg was acting was uh, asking was the role that the influx of drugs had on, on the movement. And you know, that's, that's a real, a really a good question because yeah. cocaine was a casual drug in the 70s and everybody snorted cocaine. I, I snorted cocaine with congressmen and, and Hollywood directors. So every, everybody was doing it. But when I went to Oakland in 1972, Oakland was flooded with cocaine. And we always thought the mafia was bringing the cocaine in, but it wasn't until I read Gary Webb's book, Dark Alliance, that it was the uh, Nicaraguan drug dealers who were bringing cocaine into, uh, it wasn't the Contras yet, but they, these were the Nicaraguan drug dealers in the early 70s that were bringing cocaine into California, and particularly Northern California. And those drugs found its way into Oakland. And it did affect uh, the leadership, namely Huey P. Newton. Uh, it did affect him and affect his judgment. And but there were other things that were happening with Huey, and you can, you know, you could read the book. But, but also, what happened was in in New York, in the Soho community, where the white left was located, there was a tremendous influx of heroin, and and many of the leaders of the white left became addicted. So uh, drugs. You know, these types of things have always been used to deaden the, uh, the minds and deaden the, the nerves of the people. And uh, I mean, if you haven't read the book Dark Alliance by Gary Webb, then you should read, the, you should read that book. My next book that I'm, I'm working on is called Journey to the Black Underground, and it's going to really touch on what happened in the 80s and the 90s. Uh, I think that's all the questions. Now, I, I, I just want to ask, uh, is Steve Phillips in here? Huh? Steve Phillips, come up here for a minute. Wayne, Wayne Jenkins, Wayne. Yeah, I want you two to come up here. I want you two to come up here. Okay. <laughs> Warren, 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 come, come on up here, man. Come on up here. Now, these three brothers, these three young men, they were 16 years old when they joined the Black Panther Party. They were some of our fiercest warriors, fiercest warriors. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, Warren, Warren, Warren was a basketball star. He went to O'Day, right? Garfield, Garfield, I'm sorry. But he was a basketball star, he, and, and, and I, you know, I just, I just, you know, I, I love all the comrades, but these guys were babies compared to us. And, you know, I, I just, I will always have a tremendous amount of respect for them. 
I always, and I just, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, them, and I uh, just wanted to bring you up here. Thank okay. You. All right. All right. Uh, uh, James, James Redman, James, where did ja James and, and uh, Ron and Gary and uh, who else is here? Mark Cook, Elmer, Joyce, 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 come on up here. Now I talk in my book. I talk about the legendary Redmond family. <laughs> the Redmond family was legendary. They were the baddest fighters in the CD. Nobody messed with the Redmonds. Nobody gets it together. And uh, James, Joyce, Joyce, Joyce was one of the founders with us that started the Black Panther Party here in Seattle. James was in Vietnam, but when he came back from Vietnam, he joined the Black Panther Party. Uh, Gary Owens was one of the founders. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, Ron Johnson became Elmer's right-hand man in about 1970. 1974. They did a lot of incredible work. A lot of incredible work. Uh, Michael. Michael. Mike Tagawa. Come on up here. Mike Tagawa. Michael Dixon. Where's Michael D? Jake. Jake Fiddler. Come on up here, Jake. Mike. Michael D. Michael D. He's not here. Okay. Now Mike Tagawa. He was. Uh, he came back from Vietnam. Now you see he's Japanese, he's not black, he's Japanese. <laughs> he came to Vietnam and, and jumped right in. He, he used to drill the Conrads. He used to teach. Him and Guy Carosi were the two Japanese that joined the Black Panther Party. But Mike Tagawa was one of our military experts and he trained the Conrads in how to use weapons. And Jake Fiddler, Jake Fiddler was uh, our distribution manager. He distributed the newspaper through all the stores and everywhere. Mike Dixon, come on up here. Come on. Now, this was our younger brother. He was in high school. He wanted to join the party, but we told him no. We said, two is enough right now. Two is enough. You got to go to school. <laughs> OK? 